question I had was uh, about counterpoint. Where mm -hmm. would you place uh, the teaching, if any, the counterpoint? Yeah, so counterpoint is a valuable skill. Um, and in fact, we talked about this a little bit last week with Laura. Um, so when you get to the lessons on Melody, you'll, you'll start to see, I actually posted the video from last week's symposium. Um, so you can see it, but, uh, uh, you can see it in that lesson. I actually put it underneath the lesson video. It's kind of like an, an addition to it. So it kind of explains some of the concepts a little bit deeper, but, but for me, the core of, um, basic counterpoint at least is you, you have to have an understanding of um, harmony and functional harmony and and how to kind of basically harmonize a melody um, and then uh, you have to understand voice leading um, and kind of the, the basic concepts of voice leading and uh, I think a, a problem is people approach counterpoint as a separate subject um, unrelated to everything else and the fact is that it's at this point in composition, you know, maybe in the 1600s, it was its own thing. And in fact, it was basically all there was, at least in, you know, Western classical music. But kind of after Bach, things changed significantly and counterpoint absor was absorbed fully into everything else and in, in functional harmony and uh, understanding a solid understanding of functional harmony a solid understanding of how to write a melody without a counter melody, uh, and a solid understanding of how to have at least uh, decent voice leading will make your study of counterpoint much, much easier. So, um, you know, there's there's basically the large dichotomy of, of modal counterpoint and tonal counterpoint. And modal counterpoint it's a good thing to study and I've studied it and it can actually set you up well for, um, you know, four part chorale harmonizing, harmonizing and, and, um, writing. Um, but it's also pretty disconnected from what we listen to now most of the days, unless you spend a lot of time listening to, you know, 17th century Palestrina type music. Um, so really the focus for me is more on 18th century tonal counterpoint in the style of Bach, because he really took it to its zenith um, in terms of pure tonal counterpoint. Um, uh, if you, I'm not sure if you've seen the emails on counterpoint, uh, um, but one of the things I, I put out earlier was uh, it, it's relatively simple to write a counter melody um, and that's what I think a lot of people are really looking for. I mean, you've got you've got a couple main things that are being counterpointed, right? So you've got your primary melody, um, and then against that, you generally have the bass line. And these kind of form your core of what you're listening to counterpoint-wise in any piece. Um, so when you're writing your melody, you do want to think about, okay, I don't want to have parallel octaves or fifths between the melody and the, and the bass. Um, you know, I want to keep generally contrary motion or a mixture of different types of motions. So there's contrary where things move apart. There's oblique where one stays, the other one moves. Um, there's parallel where they move by the same interval in the same direction. And then there's similar where they move in the same direction by different intervals and they may be closer or uh, further away. Um, mixing up the different types of motions uh, becomes important and um, primarily having uh, contrary motion really is what gives it the feel of counterpoint, um, at least melodically or harmonically. Um, and then also understanding how rhythm affects it all because that's the other key ingredient that if you master uh, within a single melody and just, you know, kind of homophonically. So homophonic meaning you've got a chord that's really low. Where the, you know, the harmony is effectively sustained. I mean, you could do this kind of thing, but it's still, it's kind of a sustained simple chord uh, over or under a melody. Um, 
if you understand how rhythm affects things within a single line, then you can start to put those concepts together with the bass line or with the counter melody. Um, and you don't have to be intimidated by the concept of counterpoint because it's got all this lore around it. I mean, effectively, you're writing a melody that goes with it, you know? So if we, if we have something simple, in fact, I'm going to do a screen sharing here. See if we can do something. And I'm going to mute this piano. I'll pull up Sibelius so we have some notation. And feel free to stop me if uh, if I'm droning on too much or if uh, something doesn't quite make sense. Let's see. Let's... No, everything's going fine for me. Okay. Yeah, it's good for me to think about the counter melody stuff. I think that's good. Yeah. So um, I'm not going to do a super long example, just a, a couple of measures here. Let's see, let's see in a little bit. So uh, in the Academy, we, we start with chord tone melodies because chord tone melodies are simple. Um, and the, uh, the concepts that you have to master, uh, don't, they don't get in the way of you being able to, to start composing quickly. Um, so, and that's, that's what I'm going to do here again, because you're still kind of near at the beginning of the course. Uh, but we'll try to make it, you know, kind of interesting. So uh, let's say we started with just a one chord. Um, and then something like that one five let's see well, which would be a good chord here I think this may be similar to the progression we did last week, so I don't want to get too close to that. Let's see. No, it's kind of boring. Okay, so I'll throw some Roman numerals in here. So I got one. Five, six, one. Now this is a five of six. We got a six chord right there. I would do something like that. So normally, if you have a doesn't belong in the key are you do you start thinking oh that must be five of something i mean is that typical um yes yeah, so i would definitely start with if you've got an accidental um you're probably tonicizing something especially if the next chord does not have any accidentals right so that's kind of like your initial go-to chromatic harmony is a tonicization of something um <laughs> In fact, if you remember the chart, and let me pull up the chart here, because I think you asked about the three chord a while ago, didn't you? Yeah. Um, where's the harmony? I'm just still learning how to identify what they are, because I was looking at that chord thinking, OK, that's a three something augmented, I don't know. And I'm like, oh, five of, OK, didn't occur to me. And and, and part of it is, uh, I mean, obviously, I, I wrote it right now, so I I knew right. what it was, um, but uh, part of it is listening to it. You know, uh, it takes a while to get good at, at looking at, at three notes on a screen and being instantly able to say, "Oh, that's a five chord." And I'm not. I'm just trying to keep it relatively smooth motion here. I'm not too concerned about these inversions. Um, if you look at the chart, though, this five of six would work as an E minor chord um, because it, it, part of the reason it works is because of the voice leading. So you've got a one moving to a three 
but the voice leading is really smooth. I mean, you've got two held notes and you've got one move, uh, one moving by a half step. Um, so that goes really smooth. And then three, as you can see here, can move to six. And part of the reason is, is because it's got that root movement of a descending fifth or ascending fourth. So sounds really close to, it's just the difference of a, of a half step. Um, okay. It's that root, root movement that makes it feel right. And it's the voice leading um, or the very, very small amount of, of um, movement between the, the three chords that makes it also feel right. Mm -hmm. So let's see. This is going to start sounding really low. So um, oh, that's way too slow for me. Sorry. I have a feeling this is at a quarter equals 100. So we'll push to one time. I think that's kind of a nice little theme. Um, it almost feels like these are really, uh, this really feels like one real measure. And um, it's something I don't go into in the course too much. The basic idea, the way I explain it is, a basic idea is a two measure idea that generally prolongs tonic. Um, and it's used to start off themes. But there's this concept of a, real measure versus a notated measure. And um, a lot of times you may have a basic idea that's four measures. Uh, in reality, it feels more like two real measures and it's just written in a way that makes it a little bit longer. So a good example of this is Beethoven's fifth. Da, 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 right? When you look at the score, that's four measures. But that feels like a basic idea. I mean, if you continue at the thing, it, it repeats itself, and then it goes into a continuation. Da 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 da. Right? Um, that that whole thing is like sixteen measures, but it's not. I don't. I wouldn't consider it a compound theme. That's a sixteen measure theme. I would just consider it a normal sentence that has a you know two measures equals one real measure. So. I hope that's not too confusing for people. Um, so is you know this gonna... the next one a five of three? Yes, that's a fi uh, five. Uh, this would be a five, four, two. Right, so, uh, inversion. So five, four, two of three. Then a three chord. And I, I just repeat the three chords. So that kind of kind of feels like this is, you know, this feels kind of like an idea. This feels kind of like an idea here. So let's, let's listen to it one more time just so you get it in your ears. It still feels too slow. Does that feel too slow for everybody? Or is it just me? So we've kind of tonicized three. This three feels like it's got a, it, we're at a point of rest here. Um, so, you know, I kind of like it. Yeah. So now the, the, the concept is, is that we want to, you know, have a simple way of composing a melody. Um, and that's why I like chord tones is because it gives you an easy starting point. Now, I'm not saying that Great composers have started with chord tone melodies over a chord progression. They, what happens is, is you do this so much that you internalize the concepts. But the concept of outlining your harmony with your melody generally makes a better melody. Um, and uh, so that's, that's why I believe it's a good way to start. So we can just do something, just whatever. 
would you say now when you're composing you almost always start with the harmony and then add the melody or do you sometimes come up with the melody first still i know i've asked that before but i can't remember what you've said about it i would say it's a mix i mean sometimes i start with a chord progression you know sometimes i'm just i'm just playing around and i'm like oh that's nice what can i do over that you know other times it, it could be You know, and I figure out what could I do under that. I can't remember what I did. Whatever. Um, it's a mix of both, and it's valuable practicing both ways. So, uh, right, and that's kind of um, something you do a little bit later is, is you practice just writing scale line bass melodies and writing mixing up scales and chords but it's something I, I do recommend trying both ways seeing what works for you um you know the uh i've been reading recently this book on uh um partimenti and partimenti this italian form of teaching composition basically uh they're like little roadmaps um, but they're pretty in-depth roadmaps. But uh, w what effectively they did is they took, um, you know, these kind of uh, these relatively short segments and the students would have to memorize them and be able to play on them in all keys and be able to improvise on them in all keys. And then by memorizing these things, they built up this storehouse of what... Uh, the author calls schema or schemata of, you know, relatively short, simple ideas that can be mixed together and manipulated to create much, much longer pieces, especially once you th start to throw in uh, modulation and, um, you know, more extreme forms of counterpoint fugue and things like that. So uh, it's a really interesting concept. It's something I want to develop more, but they, the, it was mostly transmitted orally. So the tradition was lost. And that's the problem is that once things got into the romantic era, uh, where it probably really would have gotten pretty cool, you know, with interesting harmonies and things like that, the schools where it was taught in Italy really died out. And it was lost to history until some musicologists in the last, you know, 15 years or so have really dug it up. Um, wow. You know, the most famous one is... schemata that they use um, and it's called uh, the, Roman, the Romanesca and that's the one that I start with it's and the reason these are so valuable is because it's not just like oh one can move to five can move to one right that's great you learn that in every harmony book but how does that fit within the context of an entire phrase or theme and in this kind of thing you learn it's like oh one can move to five but then it continues on. You know, that's that's why I think those are valuable. Um, and then at a certain point, I mean, you could have a simple theme, you know. to move into it it's not necessarily that every piece starts like canon and d and you just do the bass line and stuff it's you can insert them all over the place and you can modulate to a new key and you can throw it in there so so memorizing those kind of progressions is very useful um so but we'll, we'll get back to what we're doing here so where did i write okay so we got that we'll just do that So I'm not, let me lock the 
this in place. Not doing anything that should be shocking to anybody here. I just picked random chord tones on these things. I tried to I tried to generally have an interesting shape. So I'm moving down, moving up a little bit. Um, I'm not just going uh, like kind of trilling up and down, like up, down, up, down, up, down. That kind of stuff can get boring. So don't feel afraid to repeat a chord tone occasionally. Um, you know, have a goal. Right, this is tonic over here, or this is the kind of the new tonic, the thing we're tonicizing. So let's just listen to this. I'm not playing these. I'm not worried about is that playable on a piano. I'm just trying to make the voicing sound a little less muddy at the bottom. So okay. So at this point now, I would look at how can I make the melody just a little bit more interesting. And I'm going to save this just in case I don't lose it. Desktop melody. And the, the simple concept is, uh, you know, connecting it with on chord tones. Oops. So we'll turn that into a, a dotted note. Um, obviously, if you are throwing in a, a another note here, you got to shorten the lengths of something or, or delete something. Um, so one, two. So let's just hear what this sounds like. Eh, not the greatest thing I've ever written, but it'll do for now. <laughs> I'll probably change it a little bit later because it's, you know, I almost kind of like it better just like this, a little bit simpler. Okay, so, and then, I like to try to keep at least a little bit of motivic coherence within things, right? So if I'm going to start with a dotted quarter and an eighth note, I'm going to try to fit that in a little bit later. Um, but still have a, a little bit of variation within things. Um, So all I did here, lower neighbor tone, that's a lower neighbor tone, you know, and then a passing tone up to the E. So, but overall, I mean, there's, there's coherence between these two ideas. Um, oh, you know, I didn't even catch that. I, I put that, this, I looked at it and I wrote a C instead of a B, which C would have been a non-core tone. But then we move on to the to the A here. And this kind of feels like it's a new idea, so it doesn't necessarily have to keep the same motivic ideas. Um, we can do it, do whatever we want. Why don't we do something like that? We wanna try to avoid the augmented second. Um, it's not off limits by any means, but it's it definitely has a specific sound, and that's a Middle Eastern sound. So, and, and people can't help but hear that. So if I do something like this. It doesn't sound like Western classical music. It sounds like specifically you're trying to bring up the idea of, you know, Middle Eastern music. So um, if you're trying to sound like Bach, you're not going to see it. You're not going to see it like that, at least. So. so let's hear what this whole thing sounds like now. I think 
probably this will work like this. Better. Okay. So is there any questions up to this point now on, on how I wrote that melody or what's going on here? So will you explain the, um, so the C sharp is... That's it's a like melodic minor. minor in E minor. So this is, um, when you tonicize a chord, uh -huh. you are using the scale of the chord that's being tonicized, right? Right. Um, so if we look at an E minor scale, So this is the melodic minor scale, and then I'll do the, oops, sorry. And that's the harmonic minor scale, right? So and this, this is a, a point of confusion for a lot of people. Um, the harmonic minor scale is the harmony minor scale. So think of it like this, if you're going to create chords, you're going to be using the harmonic minor scale. Harmonic harmonic minor has a lowered six and a raised seventh. Okay. So that's basically what we're doing here is, is we're creating. The one exception is you don't augment. Augmented chords are not uh, very common in, you know, traditional tonal Baroque early classical music. Obviously, augmented chords are used, but you don't consider it a primary member of uh, the minor scale. You consider it as a uh, chromatic alteration on something. So you don't see in E minor a, a G augmented triad. It's always G major. So the three is a major chord. It's not an augmented chord, even though we have a D sharp. Interesting. Um, now, when we're talking about the melodic minor scale, we have, th this causes a lot of confusion too, and I don't think I explained it as well as I could. I may redo this section in the, in the course, but basically you've got the ascending and descending. Now, as a general rule, um, what you want to do is not have the scale conflict with the harmony. Right? So in this case, we have a, a B dominant seven chord, right? If I were to use a D natural, which is part of the descending scale, that's obviously, I mean, it sounds cool to our ears because that's a, a sharp nine and it, it's very common now because of jazz. But to classical ears, that's just a straight up no no. Versus this. Right? The, the D sharp and the C sharp do not conflict with that B7. So over a five chord, you're almost guaranteed to be using the ascending melodic minor scale. So you have a raised six and a raised seventh. However, if you were to say do a four chord, right? So we got, now we're on a four chord. That's the descending melodic minor scale. And it's because there is a C in the chord. And we don't want to conflict with that. If I were to play the ascending version, doesn't sound good at all. It sounds uh, off. It doesn't even sound as good as the, the other one where we had the, the C up here, you know. So that's the core concept of those of the melodic minor scales. You want to avoid conflicting with chord tones. Now the other concept is if um, if that's not a concern, then generally that sounds better going up. 
and that sounds better going down. So the ascending sounds better going up, and it's because of the raised leading tone moving into one versus here. This one sounds better because it's a half step moving into the five. So, oh, so that's, that's cool. yeah. Uh, and this is something where it is confusing for a lot of people, and um, and it's good to to clear it up. So. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool to hear the theory behind it because that I always wondered about that because it seemed like there was more to it. I'm like, so if you're going up, you just use sharps, and if you're going down, you just use I don't know. So that actually just really fits together. So I'll remember it. Yeah, and I'll I'll try to clear that up in um, I can't remember which lesson. I think it's an early lesson that I teach that on. But the problem is if if people aren't ready for it, uh, well, right. it can just get overwhelming with the amount of information in it. Um, right. Absolutely. So, but it could be good to just post this this example here uh, from the symposium underneath, so that way, if they're a little confused, you can watch the video. So. Well, and I've had, but, I mean, I've had piano lessons for years where we did melodic minor, and I never got it. <laughs> and nobody ever explains why am I doing this? Yeah, right. Like when I, I was a kid. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, I was horrible at memorizing scales on trumpet. I'd show up every week, and I'd basically be in the same place I was. The week before, my trumpet teacher would just be disgusted with me. But oh yeah, that's I, the way I, it is. I didn't want to do it. <laughs> yeah, well, I was terrible. My my piano teacher used to quiz me on what key I was in, and she couldn't hear very well. So if I said E, it was close enough because I could get like what five out of the seven right of yeah. <laughs> letter we were in. And so I never did learn them very well. Yeah. Mm. Okay, so we've got now, I think, a pretty decent melody. We'll listen one more time. Yeah, I'm actually pretty happy with that. I think it works out. What I'm going to do is I'm going to add uh, an additional staff here. It's a voice. It's actually in the others. I wish I could get in between, but well, you know what? I think I could just add a bass stem and then delete that other one. And delete this. Okay, so now. Yeah, it looks a lot nicer. So now we've got our chords, so we understand what our harmony is doing, and we've got a melody to start with, and now we want to do some counterpoint against this melody. Now, counterpoint is really just about writing counter melodies that in themselves feel like they are sufficiently good melodies. Like you could listen to either one on their own, and you'd be happy with it. I mean, obviously, there's more to it than that in the long run, but that's that's the core of it, is that you want to be able to write independent melodies that work well together. Um, and there's, in particular, the two, th there's what are called uh, consonant intervals and dissonant intervals. And you want to stick with consonant intervals, and you want to stick with the imperfect consonant intervals the most. So sixths, thirds, tenths, and so on. Um, you, and you can still use, you know, octaves, perfect fourths, and perfect fifths. However, you want to be careful of those because they do not outline the harmony very clearly. Um, so, and we'll just start real simple here, and I'll show you kind of how this stuff works. So if we've got a C here, if we were to start with, ooh, that's really low. If we were to start with another C, I just play this, they just sound like the same note, right? They're the same note. They don't sound like there's anything outlining any kind of specific harmony. This could be a C minor, as far as we know. We don't know at this point. Uh, this could be F major. Right? All those work, and it's because the perfect harmonies are not very clear of what the what the um, underlying harmony is. If all of a sudden I change this to an E, that's a different story. Right? 
you have a much clearer idea of what this harmony is, I mean, it's still a little ambiguous, I guess, because it could be an A minor, right? But I think that human ear tends to gravitate towards kind of the major a little bit more uh, just through repetition. I think there's more major stuff out there. Um, unless you specifically throw in something that says this is going to be an A minor, uh, you're going to probably hear that as C major from the beginning. So the other concept is, is that we want to generally have contrary motion, right? So if we stick with just these two rules, we're going to try to do sixes and thirds, and a third is the same thing as a tenth. Um, so I'm going to do a C here. Very basic. Right? Not, not breaking the bank here. We've got... This is a third, we're over a G major, right? So a B is going to work just fine here. Uh, and in fact, I could keep the B uh, because up here we go D, G. So let's hear what this sounds like. Um, so here we're going to hit a Six, so we got an E. Let's keep it as a six. And then why don't we hit a G up here? So we're trying to keep contrary motion. This one moved up, so we move down. This one moves down, so we move up. Um, so, and that, that's, oops, once again, I missed it. Uh, now here we've got a, um, a fourth, right? Not ideal, but we'll see what it sounds like. Um, ideal would actually be hitting something like that, but now we're starting to have quite a bit of similar motion here, um, which I want to avoid. Now you can, and let me show you this over here, uh, you can easily move um, in inversions, right? Uh, it always works. You'll actually see not this exact thing, because I mean, that's just relatively simple, but the underlying movement in the harmony, you'll see this frequently in music because you're not dealing, there's no parallel fifths here. Um, you can have parallel fourths, that's not uh, not allowed, you know, it's, it is allowed, I should, should say. Um, you've got parallel six here and parallel, parallel thirds here, uh, but it does get monotonous. So you don't see it extended forever, but you'll see a lot of parallel, um, you know, first inversion chords. So what that translate to, uh, what that translates to up here is that you can move in parallel motion as long as it's sixes or thirds, it's going to sound fine. So, so I guess let's just see what this sounds like now. Um, it, to me, it's getting a little bit boring with these repeated notes here. Um, but for now, I think it's okay because we're going to try to make this more interesting in the same way we made this one interesting. Um, so now it seems like we should probably go up here. That's kind of the direction that things are going, but we generally want to avoid voice crossing. So now the C is actually right here. It's above the A. Um, going unison is not illegal, uh, but it's not ideal, especially because it's on the one. Oh, you know what? I'm change this back to that, because I think it sounds a little bit better. I just noticed that. Change that back down to there. I think I like that a little bit better. Um, so yeah, going unison here, where they're the exact same note, um, is not ideal because it's on beat one. Um, so it's not going to give us any sense of the harmony. Um, However, this causes problems for us because if I do the G sharp leading to the A, 
that can't go anywhere else the way it is right now. Um, if I were to do, obviously, that just feels awkward. Um, now there's ways around this. I could run a scale from here down to there. Um, that's going to be a possibility. Um, or I could change my melody. And I think given our situation here, uh, that may be the best thing to do because it's starting to limit us with these large leaps. Something like let's do this. I'll keep that motive going. So here we've maintained, we got a third, and then we've got a sixth. None of these notes here are outside of the chord tones here yet. I haven't added any non-chord tones to anything. So it's still, it's the same exact concept for writing your first melody. You're just making sure that the harmonically it works against these, and the best way to do that, sixes and thirds. So, and then we've got, um, here. Now we can, uh, if we have a little bit of kind of rubbing between the two. Okay, so we've got something I think that'll work here. Let's, let's listen to it. You guys feel the emptiness of this sound right here when that happened? Play it one more play? time. Okay, just listen to when that happens. Did you feel it? You're talking about measure five? Um, in measure four here. Just listen, listen to this note, so the B and the E, can you feel how harmonically empty it is? It's ambiguous and it doesn't seem to outline harmony in the way that these measures do. Oh. Did you kind of feel that? Yeah. I mean, it's just a sound that you want to get in your mind when, if, if you're listening, you're not going to hear something like this in Bach which is why it's generally not done. So, so we'll do something like that. But the only reason I did that is because I was getting kind of tired of these repeated notes here. Um, okay, so now we want to do something that makes this a little bit more interesting. So just a neighbor tone there. Um, notice though, what I'm generally doing here is that if this is moving, this is resting. If this is resting, this is moving. So here, this spot may feel a little slow. So, um, but we, because of the repeated notes over here, I'm just going to leave it for now. We'll see what that sounds like. Um, now, because we can always have parallel.
Now, obviously, F sharp is not a part of C major, and we haven't tonicized, but we're going to see what this sounds like, because frequently um, I have seen in Bach, it's kind of like a foreshadowing of the tonicization that's going to happen. Um, so in fact, let's just, let's just listen to what this sounds like. I think it works. I think it it um, it doesn't sound uh, forced too much. Um, let's see. Now we've got a resting note right here, so let's see. I'm not too happy about the repeated note. You're not going to see that too often. So to make this work, um, this may seem unglamorous, but this is kind of what goes on when you're learning to do counterpoint is that uh, you may have a grand idea of what it's going to sound like, and then you find that it doesn't work. It just is awkward. So you have to modify things, change things. Um, and that's what I did. I just extended that note and change it to where it, it does kind of a similar rhythm over here. So you can hear that. Let's see. sound nice here. Let's do something like that. this works so let's listen to what this sounds like I'm gonna tie these notes over I think that'll probably sound a little bit better I'll do this so it's da 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 let's make it a little more obvious Okay, one last time, let me fix the, um, the no spacing on this is clear. Now, technically, uh, this, uh, I think this kind of works because overall this, this A, feels like we just resolved to the G there. Uh, but with a dissonance like this, it should resolve directly. But because it left down to another chord tone and then back up to the A resolves to the G, I think it still works just fine. It sounds pretty good. Um, so are there any questions about what I did here? Anything not making sense? No, that's helpful to watch the process. Yeah, I mean, part of it is really just playing around with it until it works and <laughs> and trying to stick to those core uh, core things like keeping thirds, keeping sixths, keeping the rhythm uh, similar but opposite 
from the rhythm of the, the main melody. So, you know, if you got resting in the main melody, you've got movement in the counter melody and vice versa. And those really, it's those two things together that make it feel like proper counterpoint. Um, and, and, uh, you know, and this pays off big time in orchestration. So, um, and let's just do this. Let's just see what this sounds like. And, and you'll kind of get an idea of, of the, why I'm teaching things in the order that I'm teaching them and why I haven't really introduced the orchestration to anybody yet. Because um, if you can master writing a chord tone melody and, and you can master functional harmony, and then you can master adding in non-chord tones and, and writing melodies based off of scales, and then you can master writing simple counter melodies um, and voice leading, you're set up so much better for proper orchestration. So I'm going to add some instruments here. Let's um, just add strings. We're going to add, well, we add flute. Or we add clarinet. Um, Of course, nothing has names here. That's flute. That's a piano, apparently. No, that's a clarinet. <laughs> See, all this is loading sounds here. So those are strings. These actually sound really terrible. So let me um, let me switch to note performer real quick. It's going to load for a second. Um, I don't, I don't know what everybody here is using for their notation software. Um, obviously, if you're just starting out, I recommend MuseScore because it's absolutely free. And it's actually, it writes notation really well. Um, but I've got a much better workflow in Sibelius because I've been using it for so long. Uh, but Sibelius has this add-on called Note Performer, which is relatively cheap. It's like 140 bucks or something like that. Um, but the playback is significantly better from the Sibelius sounds. So, right. Let's see. Just trip or to base. Let's go ahead and use some of these slides here. And then we're just going to take our, our melodies that in the flute. There's too many measures here. Let me delete these. They're kind of starting to annoy me. It's another reason why orchestration for when you're not ready for it can become uh, very frustrating. It's because the scores themselves get so large that they're difficult to, to handle. Um, so this is the old stuff. This is the new stuff. We'll just put a slur over that. So I was kind of hoping for a string section sound, but maybe this will work. So this is very simply orchestrated. You got uh, flute, clarinet, and strings. So strings take. Oh, sorry. Say that again. I was just going to say, so strings are taking on the full chords. Is that strings what are basically acting as our pad. And in fact, you know, I'm going to change that. To, I'm going to do like cellos, or cello, maybe it's violin. There we go. Instead of the string sound that they've got here. So it sounds more like a, a string section. Nope, don't want to do that. I'm going to delete this right here. So I'll just bump those up so it's got a little bit of a richer sound. Yeah, I think that sounds a little bit better. I'm also going to add just a little bit of dynamics so that the melodies stick out. Let's see. A little bit better than the strings. I don't want it to be.
I think that's, I mean, that's a pretty convincing little section in a classical symphony, you know? That's um, cool. And there's all sorts of things, you know, so that if you think of this as like a basic orchestrational model, right? You've got a melody in the flute, you've got a counter melody in the clarinet, and then you've got a pad in the strings. You could modify this in, in many different ways. So you could double, right? Do something like that. And then let's change this so that it's uh, something like this. Sorry, this is going to take, I'm going to mute that while I do this. So it's not like extremely annoying. Apparently that didn't mute it. You know what? I think quarter notes will work better because it's kind of a slower kind of melody. There may be a plugin in Sibelius that does this. I don't know. Plugins are great. Once, and that's another thing about Sibelius is it's got the plugins. And actually, I think MuseScore has plugins now too, so you can look at that. Some staccatos on there, make it sound nice. Let's unmute. So this is effectively variation, orchestrational variation number one on what we had. Um, I'm also going to change this to landscape so it fits a little bit better. simple. Let's do um, let's do something like this. We're going to filter top note, copy it. I should have made these all the same number of voices, but um, it's not a big deal. I'm going to filter the second. Uh, I'm just going to paste it here real quick, and then I'm actually going to put that in the flute. These are some of my workflows, so you're, you're getting to see how I um, pull things off really fast in Sibelius. Do that. Actually, I should. And then you can swap voices here, so you can do this. Voice one, two, there we go. Bam. So now we've got those. And then we're going to grab the third note. Give that clarinet. We're going to add an instrument or two here, sorry. Add bass. And then we're going to add violin one, violin two. I suppose I just moved the cello down. And then we're going to add viola. Why is this all? Everything's out of order here because I added the weird stuff at the beginning. That's looking really ugly. Hang on. I can delete this because I think I've got everything I need. Yeah. I'm gonna delete this. There we go. It's my score spacing. Okay. So basically what I'm doing here is I'm changing. I'm gonna put these chords in the woodwinds, but I'm still going to have a solid base. I'm going to filter out 
just the bottom note. And I'm going to give that to the cellos. And I'm going to give it to the bass an octave below. And then I'm going to take this melody. In fact, I'm just going to do it one in each. So filter, top note. It's fine. My wife is sneaking in the room, by the way. <laughs> and I'm going to put this in three octaves on here. So we'll see what this sounds like now. And I'm going to play them in order so you can you can kind of feel what it would be like if I were to put it in two different orchestrational styles. Are you missing the other... Oh, are you going to add the other melody? No, not at this point. I, I take it out the second. So, like, you know, you could basically do whatever you want. I, I could add in the secondary melody, um, okay. but I don't have to. I just want to see what this will sound like alone. Okay. So... I mean, it's for a very rough orchestration. I mean, I'm not giving a ton of attention to things at this point. I'm just kind of mapping out large sections with an idea of what the orchestration should be. I mean, all this is is really if you take this slice right here, you can you can map it out the rest of the way. But that's why these techniques are powerful. I mean, you saw how we started with just chords. And I mean, let's see how long this thing is. We've got 30 seconds of music right here, right? I think you could imagine writing a contrasting middle section and a recapitulation, changing up a few orchestrational styles here and there, and, and giving a little bit more attention. How do you transition from one model to the next? But in effect, it's not that hard to write a pretty simple piece for orchestra, you know, extended over... Uh, yeah, we could easily turn this into two minutes, just doing the same thing we're doing. It just takes time. Yeah. Can you swap out, just so we can hear it, can you swap out one of the lines so you can add the second melody? Yeah. So why don't we, I think it's a bit heavy with the, the bass down here, and we'll take out this line here, uh, and we'll add this. Oh, lost track. Let me get rid of this, and then... Uh, we give that the clarinet as well so that it kind of doubles. I mean, you can see I'm just kind of having fun then. We'll start from here. Actually, we'll start start from here. In fact, even if we were to just delete all these things and just hear what this sounds like, uh, let's change these to halves. Let's um, let's hear what this sounds like. over here so I don't hit space again. But um, I, I think you can kind of see that the concepts are easily translatable into different styles. It doesn't have to just be, I mean, we started with simple, you know, uh, piano music and we in about an hour turned it into uh, not quite a full orchestra, but I mean, you can see it really wouldn't be that hard. Um, one of the things that I've been uh, 
I, I've been meaning to sit down and do models through an entire, uh, you know, orchestral movement by somebody by Tchaikovsky, where it's what's one model that follows the next model in order. So you can see how it evolves throughout the piece. <clears throat> but one of the, the things I'm, I've been thinking about is that there's uh, this concept of auditory uh, scene analysis and it's, uh, studies on how we perceive sounds in our environment and what we can actually perceive as unique sounds versus what blends into kind of the background texture. And the studies that have been done basically say that we can only perceive about three unique auditory streams. So that effectively means, you know, melody, counter melody, and everything else or melody, everything else, and bass. It, you don't have unlimited resources for the human mind uh, in terms of orchestration. Now, you look at a, a, a piece like the Rite of Spring and you, and you open that up, you say, well, no way, this is way more complex. But the fact is the way you hear it, a lot of that stuff just blends into a single texture. Um, and it still comes down to you hear this texture and you hear this texture and this texture and three is about all you got. Maybe you got four. If a, some, if somebody's really highly trained, maybe you have two, if they're a young child and they, they haven't quite developed their senses properly. Um, but you're not going to have 10, you know, the good news is, is that kind of limits, uh, you know, what you're, what you have to accomplish with orchestration. I mean, if you look at, it's something like this. We've got three elements by adding a, a doubling here. We didn't add a new element. It just changes the way that this element sounds. Um, if I were to do something, uh, let's see, something like this. I know this is like ridiculous because it's Christmas time and it's super cliche. But it's not going to change what this, uh, it's not adding a new element here in terms of it's a new auditory stream. It's just modifying this auditory stream, which is the quarter note chords. So let's listen to this like this. Okay, you get the concept. But now let's modify that stream. It just blends into that original quarter beat texture. But now it's Christmas time. And it's that simple. <laughs> and that ridiculous. Um, so oh, that that's an obvious example, but it, it could be something, you know, like... Uh... like this, which is a little more complex. Uh, I'm going to have to make this a little bit quieter. So hey, no thanks so much, John. I'm going to sign oh, you out. Gone? OK, yeah, OK, you. I'll just finish this thought. And, and it's been actually pretty long anyway. So. This has actually been really helpful. Thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. So just to kind of finish up this thought, though, is you can still, you're, I'm just modifying this stream, this idea here, this concept. It gives it kind of a weird feel, kind of off, and it's because we got the flat six here moving down. It's not part of C major, um, but effectively, it sounds like it's a part of this. If I, I kind of extend it over here. Do something like that.
Okay, so I hope that kind of uh, clarifies for you um, the counterpoint. I, I know it was kind of a long-winded explanation, but does that kind of help? No, it was a very instructive and uh, quite impressive presentation. Thank you very much. Oh, you're, uh, you're very no, welcome. I enjoyed I enjoyed it very much, and uh, it, it ties in very nicely with some of the things I was thinking about and doing. So. Um, uh, even though I'm just starting out, I think this has uh, been uh, really, really helpful. Good. So thanks yeah. an awful lot. <laughs> oh, you're very welcome. And just just remember, uh, you know, really pay attention to the stuff that I'm teaching in the course because it leads to being able to write something relatively easily like this. If you follow the the concepts, you know, you'll you'll get onto this chart, and once you move onto this chart, you'll very easily understand how I wrote this chord progression. Um, and yeah. why it all works perfectly and how the melody all works and um, how this counterpoint works along. And and like I said, I don't get into orchestration and composition 101 or even 201, um, but the concepts translate very easily to orchestration. So I have yeah. uh, w one last question. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I asked my piano teacher about the difference between capital Roman letters and uh, small case of Roman letters. And she didn't know the difference. Uh, what difference are you making? Okay, so it's some people use only capital. Some people use capital and lowercase. I like to use lowercase and capital because lowercase means minor. Uppercase means uh -huh. major. Um, and obviously, these are sans serif fonts. Maybe I should change this to a serif font so it looks a little bit clearer. Um, I like the upper and lowercase versions simply because there's more embedded information with less writing. So yeah. I don't have to write a, a capital six with an M next to it or a minus, or I don't have to assume that somebody knows that a six normally is minor in a major key. Um, this tells you very clearly what it is. Uh, okay. So that's that's why I like the the uppercase and lowercase system. But you'll find people uh, and you'll find theory books that subscribe to different ways. So um, it's one of those things. A lot of times, theory is, you know, a lot of people arguing over something that ultimately just get past it. You're going to see somebody who uses all uppercase. You're going to see people who use uppercase and lowercase. You may see somebody who uses all lowercase or somebody that doesn't use Roman numerals at all and uses their own weird system. As long as you understand what they're doing, you can move past it and just get the information that's useful for you. So that's kind of how I view it. Okay. Yeah. Very good. So. Well, thanks an awful lot. And okay. uh, yeah. so are you going to have more of these uh, sessions? Every Saturday. Yeah, we do this every, every Saturday. Saturday. <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, so. Even Christmas? No, I suppose. Oh, well, okay. Yeah. I mean, there are certain Saturdays that I probably will say, hey, sorry. Uh, yeah. Sorry, <laughs> sorry if you just right. signed up yesterday. Um, maybe we'll postpone it to like Wednesday or something. I don't know. We'll see. Uh, and occasionally I get sick too, and I don't like to come on here when I'm, I'm really sick. Okay. So, um, no problem. Okay. Terrific. Thanks a lot. Yeah. See you around. Okay. okay.